Hi, I'm Holly from Slack, and I'm going to talk to you about service ownership and our bumpy journey there. Um, I've been in software for 19 years in development and then leadership roles. And one of the great things about my career is I've been able to take this technical skill set to a huge number of domains. So uh, biotech and publishing and um, government and entertainment and now at Slack. So I've done a lot of different things with computers and I've learned a lot of different things about different kinds of businesses and organizations. But I actually started my career as a mechanical engineer. I absolutely loved studying mechanical engineering. And after college, my first job was on a team that was building a new kind of engine. We were in the design phase, and I drew an awful lot of mechanical drawings like this one. Sent them out for fabrication. They came back, ran my test, did all the calculations, redesigned the parts, and repeat. I worked there for two and a half years, but the entire time was this really slow slog of designing, testing, and learning, each cycle months long. And at the end, we didn't even have a product or even a field-testable prototype, just a series of test units like this one. And we were still just in the lab, not in the field. At the same time, I was writing software to interface with the sensors for testing and for the fuel and airflow control systems. And that software grew and matured a lot faster than the engine. I found it really satisfying to write that software every day. And for me, it turned out to be a lot more satisfying than trying to build the engine for years. So I made the switch to engineering full time and haven't looked back. And it isn't because I don't love making things. I absolutely do. And it wasn't because I wanted to throw away four years of expensive specialized education because I definitely didn't. But for me, mechanical engineering work was just way too slow. You know, any given test might give you 10 more ideas, but it would take you forever to work through any of them and find a great solution. And meanwhile, on the product I was on, we didn't even know if we had product market fit. We just had test units. Whereas with software development, everything was super fast. You could write some code, test it immediately, and then fix it right away if it wasn't working. And if you had really good tests and you had good user testing, then you had confidence you were building the right thing every day. I didn't have the right word for it then, but it was the difference between a fast and a slow cycle time around this loop. Designing a part or some code or a business process, try it out, measure your results, learn from those results and try it again. And the faster you go around this loop, the better. I had been exposed to all these principles in college when studying the history of manufacturing. The Toyota production system, developed after World War II, revolutionized car manufacturing at the time, and it was the precursor to what we now call lean manufacturing. Traditional car manufacturing relies on big stockpiles of parts and finished cars to fulfill orders, which meant that you had to predict like a year in advance how much you would need and then pay for like making and storing all of those parts in cars. But the Toyota production system designed out all of that. An order from a production dealer triggers the production of a new car at the plant. So the dealer is pulling a car from the plant to fill that empty spot on their lot because they just tr sold a car. And so the plant starts making a car, and as they use up parts, then they'll pull parts from their supplier. They'll track parts at the factory using physical cards called Kanban. And the Kanban cards stay with the parts as they travel through the plant. And when all the parts in a bin are used up, then you've got this card um, with no parts, and you place that on a Kanban board. And a card without parts represents a, basically an empty slot in the system that needs to get filled. So the cards start on the left side of the board, move right, this might look familiar. Um, and then uh, as the fabrication is completed, they exit the board and get attached to new parts. Um, and you can control basically how much inventory you have in the system by limiting the number of those cards you have. And so like a decade after I visited a, a factory and saw cards attached to parts, uh, I started using uh, Kanban in developing software on an agile team. And I'm like, whoa, 
Like, these are the exact same thing. I had no idea. And so everything about lean manufacturing that I had learned got combined with how to make software. Um, so the cards still represent work to do. Uh, the cards still flow from left to right when they're completed. And hypothetically, eliminating waste and reducing cycle time are still the primary goals. But res besides reducing waste, one of the most important concepts in the Toyota production system is Kaizen, which is sometimes translated as continuous improvement. So for example, line workers in a factory are empowered to change their workstations, um, to improve their work, and work teams can actually reconfigure the factory uh, to make things more efficient, often without involving management. And so everyone at the factory is empowered to design and measure their own work. So empowerment is really key to Kaizen. Otherwise, improvements would go through layers of approval and change slows down. So the Toyota production system, Kaizen and lean manufacturing all look a lot like the lean thinking we do in software. Like most of you, I've been through my share of agile transformations. I've taken the trainings, I've become a scrum master, I've probably attended thousands of daily stand-ups at this point, um, groomed giant backlogs, and I've been in at least two or three really lively debates about what the best way to size user stories is and do you include bugs in the sprint planning. But in my experience, a lot of teams practicing Agile are putting in a lot of effort to do it right and uh, not really living the benefits. So organizing the work feels really great and staying in sync with my coworkers with daily stand-ups feels awesome. Uh, writing code every day is still great. Knowing that my code was compiling and passing tests and giving me the output I expected was still exhilarating, but that's not enough, right? You need to ship to the user. You need to learn in production. Uh, you need to test in production, like we learned yesterday. Um, and all that execution has to uh, actually add up to something. And too many Agile teams I've been on feel like this, a really fast dev team on a treadmill. And you, you tell yourself you're doing well, you know, your Agile metrics show you've got short lead times or accurate estimates, but you're not actually shipping. Um, and I'm not talking about the differences between Scrum and Kanban and Lean. You know, I've used all of those and each of those can fail in this way. So personally, I've observed two things that differentiate teams that are delivering the right things fast and teams that aren't. The first is executive dedication to learning. If your highest leaders are not committed to creating a learning and adapting organization, uh, one that is fearless in the face of change, then no team in that org is going to succeed under those terms either. And the second thing, is high trust teams. So high trust teams can really dig into what's not going well and suggest radical changes to make it better. And they can push themselves to do that over and over again. A high trust team can execute the design measure learn cycle and make progress incredibly quickly. Too often teams aren't willing to really measure and learn and try new things. It is a lot more comfortable to avoid conflict, not talk about the bigger issues. It is a lot more comfortable to avoid the pain of change, especially when that change might fail. So a lot of teams languish, uh, not asking the hard questions, not really learning. Um, but if you're not learning and changing, you're going nowhere. All right, what does this have to do with Slack? So Slack launched in February 2014, and it grew really quickly. So within five years, we grew to uh, 10 million daily active users. We went from supporting really small teams to supporting some companies that have hundreds of thousands of users each. Uh, and because Slack um, is a communication tool, like people keep it open for nine hours a day uh, actively uh, using it. We went from about 100 servers to over 15,000 servers uh, in AWS 25 uh, data centers. And then, of course, we grew from eight to 1,600 employees in 10 international offices. So that is a ton of growth. And Slack really lives and breathes this uh, lean thinking and executive dedication to learning is super high. And part of why that is, is that Slack itself is a massive pivot. It started as a gaming company and 
their game like basically failed to make money fast enough. And they're looking at the end of the company, uh, winding it down, and they're like, well, we've got this eternal chat program that we wrote for ourselves to make it easier to make the game, and maybe that would do okay in the marketplace, and uh, that, that kind of worked out. Um, so what's great is that from the very, very beginning, shipping code changes fast to users was a priority, so they set up continuous deployment systems where any developer can push code to production in minutes, uh, built-in experiment frameworks to test features and interface changes with slices of your user base. Um, and we were always releasing major features, uh, testing them with users uh, along the way. And we're lucky enough to have a design and user research department that measures how our users are experiencing Slack, so great. Uh, but there's something that along these five years didn't really scale, and that was the centralized operations team. So who's responsible for the management, monitoring, and operation of a production application? There is no right answer to this question. But a centralized operations team was Slack's answer for a lot of years. One team to do your cloud instances and write all the Chef and Terraform, take all the pages, manage all the incidents, you know, divide, divide your labor uh, into specialized areas, right? So the product developers are focusing on features and scale and architecture. Uh, this model works really well for a lot of companies. And to be honest, it worked for Slack for a long time. Um, in the early days, most Slack developers knew the whole code base. And as Slack grew, ops engineers generally knew who to contact to, help, to get help. So ops was getting all the pages in the early days. And the devs just showed up when there was a problem and things were basically working out. But as time went on, growth really meant that product development scaled faster than ops. And at one point, we were at about 20 to 1 on uh, product devs to op engineers. So how can operations reliably reach a developer when there's a problem? Um, so gradually, the developers started to go on call. Um, just the most ultra senior developers at first. There was a group of like eight to 12 engineers, basically. And um, they had this rotation, and they could be escalated to if something was beyond Ops's power to fix. And so there were sort of different thoughts and feelings happening. Uh, Ops was happy that developers were going to be available via pager duty escalation in some sort of organized fashion to help. Um, but some of the devs had never been on call in their whole life, so they were, you know, scared and not confident that it was going to work. So now we're at ops getting the first pages, but the ultra senior devs are on call, um, and uh, that, that worked for a little while, and, you know, even if the dev on call didn't know how to fix something, you still knew who in the org did know, right? Like, call mode, she knows how this stuff works. Uh, she'll probably answer. So again, right, like Slack is a high trust organization and uh, this goes on for a few years and uh, more engineers, more features, more systems, and more and more often the on-call dev doesn't know how to fix the problem. So we ask this question again, like how can operations reliably reach a developer when there's a problem and call, reach the right developer? So in fall of 2017, most of the product developers went on call. Seven new pager rotations were created basically overnight, uh, covering specific parts of Slack's infrastructure and product. But the change management for this change was pretty bad. Uh, ideally, people are involved, included in the changes to their work, right? Like empowered, continuous improvement. Um, but this change came from the top, and it really disempowered people. Um, Ops was feeling pretty happy because uh, we had these new rotations like um, search or front end or back end so you would actually be able to reach somebody who might be able to help you with a specific problem you were seeing. But the devs were initially pretty surprised like, oh my gosh, I'm on call now? What happened? Um, but they were, that, that uh, sort of fear was tempered by 
one of the bad aspects of these on-calls, which is that some of them were really big, right? Like all the front-end engineers or all the back-end engineers. And so some of these folks were only on-call two, three, four times a year. Um, and being on-call is like anything else. You learn by doing it. And so if you're only on-call a couple of times a year, you are probably scared each time because you don't get used to uh, the sensation of being on call and sort of the, the life um, patterns you have to set up for it. And so, um, uh, and if you get paged, you don't know how to be in an incident either because, again, you're only in it like three times a year. So at this point, fall 2017, Ops is getting the first pages still. Now all the senior devs are on call and we've got seven more targeted pager rotations. So we're evolving. Um, at this point, we've also got dozens of production deployments every day. So we've got that really great continuous deployment system that empowers the developers to push to production within minutes, um, which means that ops has to keep a really detailed understanding in their heads of the whole system. And you have to know um, which of those pager rotations to page given what symptoms you're seeing. And so, the ops engineers are basically human routers, uh, either finding the pager rotation or the specific people that need to help you in any given incident. Slack keeps growing. More people, more systems, more code. Um, even with seven rotations, over time, it, it was a good chance that the dev who was paged didn't know about the subsystem having problems, which left the devs feeling like failures and ops still feeling really overburdened and still end up calling people who weren't on call who were the ones that knew how something worked. So in a learning organization, the post-incident meeting or post-mortem, like most of us call it, uh, there's, a, there's a chance in that meeting to learn about the unexpected complexities of the system, um, the nuance of how things fail, uh, and really extract that learning from people who know it best but the problem at this point was that at Slack, postmortems were not uh, a great place for learning. They were being run by the ops engineer. Uh, postmortems were being run by the ops engineers, who again, like, were tired and overworked. They didn't have the time or the context to prepare in the way that you need to to make a really good postmortem. Um, and so the postmortems really weren't about learning. They were about creating lists of action items. And usually people didn't think that attending would be a great use of their time. So only the group that sort of felt that they needed to attend because uh, they were directly involved in the incident attended and everyone else stayed away. All right. So right around that same time in fall 2017, operations got new leadership and we had a reorg and a mission change. And uh, like any good... Uh, reorg, you got a new name, so now operations is called service engineering. So we asked ourselves a new question, which is, how do we ensure that the developers know that there's a problem? So we decided that centralized operations was no longer the answer. Service ownership was basically our DevOps transformation. The idea that the dev teams that write the code owns the operation of that code right down to getting the pages and running the incident response. So obviously there was a radical departure from Slack's past, uh, and that level of change can be pretty uncomfortable. But we really, really leaned on the fact that Slack is a high trust learning organization, so we really dug into that trust and got to work. So the idea was is that service engineering would focus on providing tools, guidance to producing products like a cloud platform, storage platform, uh, and uh, slowly push operational responsibility toward the dev teams. So what about those really high stakes teams, right? The ones that really do need that support? We decided to create an SRE team. So uh, SRE means a lot of different things at different places. So at Slack, uh, SRE are DevOps generalists who have high emotional intelligence and a mentoring capability because they are skilled practitioners of DevOps and ambassadors of this new way of working, right? They're basically selling this way of working to these dev teams. So we embedded SRE into these uh, 
a uh, few select teams uh, to increase operational maturity, uh, improve the reliability of services, and uh, this was really a grassroots effort from the SREs themselves. Management's role was to empower them, remove roadblocks, and get out of the way. So we're really excited. You know, everyone's super on board. We've got success metrics. We've got the team pairings. But that operations work actually didn't go away. Now it's SRE who are getting those first pages, right? We didn't change our alerting strategy first. So um, SREs are getting the first pages dozens a week. Uh, there's still dozens of production appointments a week. Um, so how do we lower the operational burden on the SREs? So the SREs made a plan. We're going to categorize and reroute all these existing paging alerts to the right teams so they can act on them, right? Um, and then this non-existent centralized operations team won't be getting these pages anymore, and they'll have the time and energy for their embedded teams. So we started talking about, like, what does that look like? Um, teams should know what they own, right? Like, what team owns what? Uh, surprisingly, this was a difficult question to answer. Um, it sort of had to st start with step negative one, which is like, who owns this stuff? Um, and had to find formal ownership for all of these features and uh, software that, that just had names of people who had worked on them last. And then we said, like, we, we defined a whole uh, set of criteria for like what service ownership meant, and it mean, means a lot of things, but it also includes like, hey, you've got to have at least one alerting health metric, latency, throughput, whatever's important for your feature. Um, started getting teams on call ready, you know, right sizing them. We heard about pizza teams, um, and uh, uh, starting to think about moving away from all front end engineers being on the same rotation, all back end engineers being on the same rotation. All right. So again, the devs are like, okay, this sounds kind of scary, but we're, we're pretty much on board. Um, we, we're going to need some training, some documentation, maybe some guardrails in the system so we don't mess stuff up. Um, and so the SREs start planning all of those things. And nothing changed <laughs> because making progress on training and guardrails is really slow when you've got uh, the, the site to keep up all day. So the dev teams, they're starting to work on their, on their health checks and like tuning and tweaking their alerts into channels to make sure that it's just right. Um, and the SREs are working on their training and their guardrails and some automation. Uh, and everyone's working really hard, but again, we're going nowhere because we're aiming for perfe perfect perfection. Um, so the SREs are looking every week at all of these alerts and the vast majority of them were host level alerts, you know, low CPU, out of memory, out of disk. Um, those had been paging the uh, operations for years and they were a huge component of the alerting strategy. And there was a lot of uncertainty about turning them off. So finally, we're like, okay, you know, test with your users, go to those dev teams, say, here's the alerts we think your team would get, like, what do you think? Uh, and those dev teams are like, what are you talking about? Those alerts are totally useless. Like, they, those mean nothing to us. Uh, and honestly, it was like coming out of a fog. It was like, oh my gosh, that's right. Like, we shouldn't learn on this stuff in the first place. We shouldn't even be getting these alerts. Um, we should just be throwing away these hosts and focusing on, like, automatically reprovisioning hosts and making sure the services can actually handle that. Great. So, uh, we started working on that. Guess what that looks like? <laughs> We wanted to do all this automation first, right? We wanted to do it right. Um, we knew it was possible. We could envision it in our minds, but, um, you know, we were still moving way too slow. And then this breakthrough came um, uh, last fall. So there are these moments of organizational clarity that happen. And for us, it was a, a push from senior leadership that reliability and fast incident response were literally the most important things that we could do in engineering. And so in this moment of intense uh, clarity, um, we decided we're not going to waste this crisis. We're just going to swallow our fears and take the plunge. So one afternoon, we just turned off every single one of those low-level alerts. I walked over to the desks of these dev teams and said, OK, today's the day. You're going on call, and you're turning on those alerts that you've been uh, carefully crafting for months now. Um, so on that day, with no pre-planning, 
the devs went on call for their own alerts. And everything worked. <laughs> everything was fine. Um, there, was, there was really bad change management, once again. Uh, no comms plan. We had skipped way ahead on the timeline. But all the people affected had been working towards this for months. They knew it was coming. Um, and they were empowered to continue to change those alerts and their own, own on-call strategy after that day because they more fully owned these services now. And ever since then, those SREs have been able to fully dedicate themselves to the teams that they're embedded in. So now, today, there are dozens of development uh, rotations, one for each team. We have a growing number of paging alerts to tell us when features and services are failing. Um, and I've seen all these teams continue to improve monitoring, alerting, provisioning, automation, decoupling services to reduce failures. So, in short, uh, teams continue to dramatically improve the resilience of their services. I'm not going to tell you everything that's happened in our journey to service ownership, but we continue to make uh, improvements. Teams of developers more fully own their systems. It's totally expected that you're on call for your systems. Uh, but here's a couple of things we're still working on. We're still asking ourselves uh, and challenging ourselves to improve our postmortems. Um, we've hired some experts. We've conducted a lot of training in how to do post-incident analysis and investigation. Uh, and we're still continuing to heavily invest in this area. We also really want to have trained incident commanders for every incident. But this skill set is still too centralized within service engineering. And so we're, we've gotten um, a lot of trainings together. We've gotten a lot of people trained up. We've also added it to the engineering career ladder um, and to sort of uh, incentivize people to participate. But it's still falling mostly to service engineering. So we've got some ideas. It's a major focus for us right now. Um, and like most places, we're asking ourselves, how can we make it easier to operate a service? Uh, without any specialized training in Chef and Terraform and things like that. So, like most of you, we're uh, building a Kubernetes platform. Early, early signs are good, um, and we're continuing to invest there as well. So, in short, we've made a lot of progress. There's still a lot of work to do. Slack uh, continues to be a high-trust organization, and so you can ask about what's not working and suggest really radical changes. Uh, and so I know that we're going to continue to make progress. So I want to leave you with one last thought. The Toyota production system designs out overburden and inconsistency and eliminates waste, but their entire management philosophy as a company is designed around that way of working. Low inventory levels, which saves money, is just one really visible outcome. So some other businesses, uh, when they saw how successful Toyota was, tried to just lower inventory levels uh, in isolation without understanding the philosophy or imp making empowered working environments. Um, and those projects failed. So imitating another company or process without understanding the underlying concepts doesn't work. What works for Toyota or Slack or me won't necessarily work for you. Just like following the scrum process perfectly won't lead you to amazing results. So the most important thing to know is what you're trying to accomplish and be willing to learn and try again and again. So I'm not saying that mechanical engineering is a bad profession. It just didn't work for me. And I'm not saying that centralized operations can't work. It just doesn't work for Slack anymore. Change is possible no matter how hard or impossible it feels. So ask yourself what feels wrong about your work and imagine a different future. And don't be paralyzed by doubt or perfection or uncertainty. You don't have to be ready to make a change. If you have the support of leadership, if you're in a high trust environment and you're empowered to make change and you can commit yourself to continuous improvement, then progress is inevitable. Succeed is the speed and skill with which you go around this loop. So design thoughtfully measure ruthlessly, and learn faster. Thanks.